Thank you all. The feeling was palpable in the first session. Every time he revealed something, the mystery was not um, that you were being challenged. And of course, that is one of the goals of our seminars here, not simply to reiterate things you've heard a hundred times, knowing many of you have heard of this mystery before, uh, or heard that there is a mystery before, but rather to challenge you in your understanding so that we can become better ministers and stewards of the mysteries God's given us. Uh, a lot of times we love drawing the chart as Dustin drew out here, and uh, we love pointing out the, uh, how to understand your scripture rightly divided and dispensations and all of that, and that is, that is all good and fine. But the seminar this week is not about dispensationalism or right division, but what is the mystery? The mystery made clear, which is the theme, and there's so much confusion about that about what the mystery is. There's so much ignorance that there is a mystery, and that's where the chart comes in handy. That's where you showing people, hey, look, that, that was kept secret, and there was prophecy, and there's mystery, and there's a difference there. Things that are different. And that, that's handy to show people that there is one. But then what is it? Because our ministry isn't just to show people that there is one, to show people what it is. And that's where you who see that there is one have to study to find out what it is because it affects your life, how you live for Christ, how you understand the gospel. It affects what God is doing today in and through you. And so it's not just, oh, now I understand the scripture, which is praise God for that, <laughs> that it was a closed book and now I know where to find my instructions. Perfect. What do they say? <laughs> what do they say that is drift different and that is more excellent, right? And so we're hoping to resolve some of that confusion um, that uh, he, he, he distinctly, doesn't do a great job, distinctly pointing out um, those things that may challenge us as we call grace believers or those who, who know that there is a mystery. Uh, some of the things we may roll off the tongue, well, it's Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, which we know, of course, the 12 apostles did not know about in Jesus' ministry, though it was in the scriptures. They didn't know about it, right? And so we know that distinction, how it's the gospel that saves that Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead, as it clearly says in 1 Corinthians 15. So we know those things. Uh, what's that have to do with the mystery? And that's what's important. Why is it the cross is the gospel? Why is it that Jesus Christ, who was prophesied from the beginning of the world, why is he, what does he have to do with this mystery, the mystery of Christ? Okay. And so if you're like me, when you were in church growing up, and many of us in America grew up in churches, um, less so these days, but many of us, the only time you heard the word mystery was in this phrase, God works in mysterious ways, <laughs> right? Who hasn't heard that in church? Which is amazing, because what that's saying is, we don't know, right? God works in mysterious ways, we don't know. This is the only time you hear the word mystery. And so when you read in Ephesians chapter 3, where Paul says, have you heard of the dispensation of the grace of God given me to, to you word? Wherefore, I wrote in four words, the mystery, you know, uh, in Son of Ephesians 3, let's just read through that. Ephesians 3, uh, 1, for this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which has given me to you word, you see Gentiles there, you see grace there, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, oh look, there's a mystery in the Bible, and if you're or like me, the first time you read that, you're going, what is that exactly? And why is anyone talking about it? I mean, it seems like we talk more about the fishes and the loaves and walking on the water and, you know, the things that happened that last week before he died than whatever this is. And, of course, there's not a lot of stories here in Ephesians 3. That makes it harder to understand. You've got to think about the doctrine here. But there's this mystery that was revealed, as I wrote afore a few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Let's put it to rest right now that even though God, there's things about God's we don't know, the mystery here, we can know. Because it says, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So it's not good enough here to say, well, God works in mysterious ways and give up on it. We got to know what this is. Verse 5, in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And that, that, there you go talking about the mystery here. Now, Ephesians 3 verse 9 says, we're to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. It's a task God gave Paul and gave the church to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. The fact you've never heard that's the church's commission is really a shame. But this is what we're supposed to be doing. But that raises the big question. What is this we're supposed to make all men see? Oh, we'll draw a chart and show them that it was kept secret. Romans 16, 25. It's the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. And you need to show people that because the mystery is not prophecy. Prophecy is not mystery. There's a difference. Things that were revealed were not things that were secret, right? And you got to know all of that that was revealed. 
If all you spend all your time studying is Paul, right, then you don't know that there was grace back there. And then suddenly you're talking to someone and they go, wait a minute. That's all they study is the red letters. There's grace back here. There's faith back here. And you're going, uh, 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 I was told. Well, don't follow what you're told. Study the scripture. All of it. And you'll see that grace, faith, you'll see that Gentile blessing was all part of God's purpose. So you need to know what in the world this, this mystery is that is different, that was kept secret. Okay? Reading Romans 16.25 does not tell you what the mystery is. Right? It was, it's, he says, what establishes you is my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. It's been revealed, which was kept secret since the world began. And it's kind of like a cliffhanger. What is it? And we just got to stop there. See, it was secret. What? It was secret. Exactly. Ephesians 3, verse 4 says there's a mystery. You can read that he wrote before about what is it? Right? It doesn't tell you what it is. Okay? So many of us haven't heard, even though we may have read that there's a mystery in the Bible, we've not heard that it's been revealed and that we can know it. What is this fellowship of the mystery? Point number one, we need to point out that the mystery is a fellowship. You know what the verse says? What is the fellowship of the mystery? So people say, well, the mystery is fellowship. Well, God, he didn't bring it up, but God wanted fellowship with humanity from the garden. Remember? He created man to have fellowship with him. So fellowship with God is not really the mystery. If we... Uh, Right up here and say, God and you, this fellowship between you and God, that's not a mystery. God wanted that, right? So, fellowship, another word that we don't hear a lot of discussion about in church, unless it's attached to the word fun. You've heard that? <laughs> We're going to have preaching, teaching, boring, and then fun and fellowship afterwards. Right, you all know what that is. That's the good part. Which really kind of distorts the idea of fellowship. It's not just like, okay, have the Christians over at your house. That's fellowship. That's not what it is. It's not like, we'll have the lesson, and then after we watch the Super Bowl, and that's the fellowship part. No. The fellowship is what you have to do with God. Okay? It's this connection, this partnership, this communion. It's how you're knit together in one. By definition, the word fellowship means partnership, joint interest. Okay, it means companionship or communion. It means this thing that brings you together. The political conversation the last few weeks in our country has been how our president has had any fellowship or what with the Ukrainian president. This is the conversation. Right? Is there any connection? Are they knit together? Are they in conspiracy? What's happening? You know, um, you know, when you get married, this is a partnership, right? A joint interest. And the fellowship you have with your spouse is different than the fellowship you have with me. Granted, right? Fellowship. There's a fellowship in marriage. There's a fellowship you have with your employer or your employees that differs from that you might have with your family. Okay? Different types of partnerships, communions, connections, joint interests. Right? That's what fellowship is. Now, this word fellowship that's in the scripture, perfectly good biblical word. The evangelicals, the, I call them evangelies, prefer the word relationship. That's what they love to use. Now, the word relationship does not appear in your King James Bible even once. Okay? The word relationship does not appear there. But it kind of has a similar meaning to fellowship. What is the relationship between you and God? Okay. But it kind of lends to the emotional, doesn't it? Like what kind of relationship? Do you need a personal relationship with Jesus? So have a personal relationship with Jesus. What's that mean? I'm going to love him every day. I'm just going to draw hearts on my toast, you know, and that sort of thing. <laughs> it doesn't seem to fit exactly what Ephesians 3.9 is going to talk about here. Now, Bible correctors, and this is from all scope of Christianity, prefer in Ephesians 3.9, instead of calling it the fellowship of the mystery, they like to change the word fellowship to administration or dispensation or plan. Some people, even friendly to what you read, may say, oh, it's the dispensation of the mystery, because, you know, we're dispensationalists. Don't change the word, folks. Administration, dispensation, plan are too impersonal. So here's the dispensation God has for you. Oh, great, that makes you really feel one with the Lord. It's, it doesn't work. He said dispensation in Ephesians 3 verse 2. Right? Let the Bible say what it means. Keep the words there. Don't change them. And you will come to a greater understanding. Don't try to change them to benefit the Bible. It doesn't work, even if it's in your favor. Because God knows better than you. Right? So let the word stay. It says there's a dispensation of grace in verse 2. It says there's a fellowship of the mystery in verse 9. Right? What is this fellowship? What is this partnership, joining us, companionship? What is this communion you have, this connection you have, this oneness you have, with God. Okay? This is what we're going to talk about. Now look at 2 Corinthians 6, just real quick. 
to get a biblical definition of the word fellowship, you can turn to 2 Corinthians 6, 14. And this is how the Bible defines words. It'll use one word then say like the same thing. You notice that in the Bible? It says like the same thing over and over and over again sometimes. And you're like, okay, I read that. He's saying it again, read it. Well, those parts are useful because they're defining for you. They're explaining for you what it intends to say. And so in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14, I'm looking here for definition, not for the, the teaching of the passages, but look for the word fellowship here. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? Now, what's the commonality there? These things don't belong together. And what's the words it uses? Together, fellowship, communion. I wonder what fellowship means. Together, communion. Right? Verse 15, what concord hath Christ with Belial? What part hath he that believes with an infidel? What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? What's fellowship mean? Agreement, concord, together, communion, being one. Now here he's teaching that there's things you should not be one with, together with, right? But we can learn what fellowship means from this verse, right? What the word itself means. And again, this idea of fellowship, God has had from the beginning of the scripture. He created humanity to have fellowship with them. From the garden, he, he walked in the garden and wanted fellowship with Adam and Eve, right? Gave them a, a, his purpose there in the garden. In the scripture from the beginning, he taught Adam and Eve that the two become one in marriage, right? And so there's this fellowship there he creates in marriage. And of course, throughout the scripture, even after man fell, God creates covenants with humanity. Gave laws and covenants. Why did God make covenants with humanity? Right? And as every covenant theologian will tell you, it's because of his grace. Obviously, yes, that's true. He made covenants with Abraham because he wanted to have fellowship with humanity. That was his ultimate goal. He says, I will make you a promise. He didn't have to do that, you know, but he did. He gave a covenant to Moses, says, here's my covenant with you, because he wanted to have this, this fellowship with humanity. You get it? So this is what the word means. Now, in Ephesians 3, 9, when it says, we're to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, the word fellowship still doesn't tell us what the mystery is, does it? But we now know that it is a fellowship. It's describing this. This, this uh, partnership and communion and oneness we have with God. In fact, it's called the mystery of Christ. And so what's going to end up being here, it's God in Christ. Because Christ is God, right? He's, Christ is, and so we have Christ in you. What is this fellowship of the mystery of Christ here? Of course, in the scripture, what ruined God's fellowship with humanity was sin. By one man sin entered, and, and, and that's been the problem from the beginning, right? And so you have this issue. But throughout the scripture, you have words that describe uh, this fellowship God tries to have with humanity. For example, covenants, uh, kingdom, God's kingdom that he's prophesied from the beginning of the world has had the intent of him dwelling on the earth with humanity, right? Kingdoms. Uh, and these are also, by the way, uh, not coincidentally, uh, on purpose on their own part, names of churches across your town. Uh, first covenant over there, you know, second kingdom, Baptist, whatever. Uh, nations is a word in the scripture God uses to have fellowship with humanity. He chooses a nation, Israel. People call themselves Israel. Flocks, and so you have the, the, the third church of the great shepherd over there, you know, they're a flock. Well, this is terms describing the way God has fellowship with humanity at different times. What about uh, the, the olive tree ministry over there? Trees. This describes God's fellowship with humanity at certain times, right? Of course, you got the, in your Christian bookstore, you got a whole aisle of, of songs by the vineyard, right? And the vineyard church. Well, this again describes in the scripture, not for you, uh, where God has fellowship with some people in a certain way as a vineyard. These are all not mystery fellowships, are they? Okay, so what is the fellowship of the mystery? Is not a vineyard, tree, nation, kingdom, flock, covenant. That's not the fellowship of the mystery. So what is the fellowship? What kind of fellowship is it? If God always wanted to have fellowship with humanity and were to make men see this fellowship of the mystery, this mystery fellowship, what is this fellowship, this connection, communion we have with Christ? How are we joined what is the fellowship of the mystery? You say, tell me. Finally, I will tell you. Okay. <laughs> Let's look at Romans chapter 12, verse 5. Now, I know light bulbs are going to go off here because we sing about it, we talk about it, and we've, we've mentioned already that grace and faith and Jesus and, and his death on the cross, which was prophesied, and his resurrection, and was prophesied. None of that's the mystery because it was prophesied. It can't be. And when I tell you what this is here, you're going to say, ah, oh, yes, I knew that. I know you know it, but stop telling people what it's not. It, as what it is, because you're confusing people, or at the very least, they're coming to you with objections that you can't answer, right? 
But the scripture says this, and you know what, folks? We're not trying to segregate scripture away from our understanding. All scripture needs to be understood. Not just one part of it, all of it, right? We learn the mystery in Paul's epistles. But if you don't understand the rest of scriptures, you'll make a mess. Okay, you need to know all of it so that you can understand precisely what the mystery is. And when you do that, you'll grow in your knowledge of the truth. Okay? The mystery is going to end up being, in Romans 12, verse 5, the body of Christ. Ah, oh, yes, I knew that. It's the body of Christ. It's the body of Christ that describes this fellowship we have with him. Okay? It's going to be this body of Christ that we're all members of through the gospel. That's going to describe how we have a oneness with him, this connection with him, and by which we get all the blessings and benefits of his cross work. It's because of this body of Christ, which, by the way, was not spoken of at all in the scriptures since the world began. The body of Christ is the mystery. Read the book of Ephesians, which is all about the mystery, which we just read Ephesians 3, 9. Body of Christ is talking about all throughout there. This oneness communion you have with him. Okay? It's going to end up being this one new body. This describes what the mystery is, right? Not only the literal body of God manifest in the flesh, which prophecy spoke about, but this new creature, this one body called the body of Christ, whereby all believers get put into, right? And so you in Christ, you see that? that isn't that what the body of Christ is? It's you being put into him. Right? That's what that is. This is the mystery. Look, Romans 12, verse 5 says, We being many are one body in Christ. We define fellowship. Doesn't the word one describe a fellowship? If I say we are one, what am I saying? There's some sort of connection we have. There's one body is what he says it is. The fellowship of the mystery is a body of Christ. It's one body. And it says in verse 5, and all members have not the same office. We'll, we'll, we won't do that right now. Let's look over in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 27. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Paul talks about this in all of his epistles. Now ye are the body of Christ. The word ye there in the King James Bible is plural. That tells you it's talking to the whole group, right? And that you're all, if you're saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of grace, you're the body of Christ. That's the mystery, folks. The body of Christ. It's one body. In Colossians 1.18, let's look there. Colossians 1.18. Here it's talking about Jesus Christ being the image of God, and by him all things were created in verse 16. He is before all things, by him all things consist. We'll talk more about that tomorrow. In verse 18, he is the head of the body. That's why I drew Christ up here. He's the head. He's the head of the body. In verse 18, the church. You see it? People like to say, well, Israel and the church are different, which is true. They're different. And then people respond with, well, there's a church at Pentecost. Yes, but is it the body of Christ? That's the mystery, right? Have you ever heard that before? Well, there's a church of Pentecost. Well, there's a church in Matthew 16, too. And in Acts 7, and in Exodus, there's a church. The church simply talks about the gathering of God's people, the congregation, that, that sort of thing. The Old Testament word's congregation, right? But the mystery is the body of Christ. So you'll never have a problem again when someone says, well, there's the church right there. But is it the body of Christ? That's the mystery, right? Colossians 1.18. Look at Colossians 3.15. And by the way, you can't, you can't stop there. Well, it's just the body. You have to know, as we'll talk about in a moment, what that means, that you're the body of Christ. It's not just claiming, I am the body, which is, that's Sunday school, folks. That's mystery Sunday school. You have to know what that means, that you're the body of Christ. What that means you have claim to. What that means that you're able to live by. Colossians 3.15. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body. You see the fellowship word there? One body. Okay, so it's all over this one body. Now look at Ephesians 1.19. This one body, you say, well, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John talk about the body of Jesus. Well, they talk about Jesus' own flesh, is what it talks about. Paul says, we know no man after the flesh. Even Christ, we no longer know after the flesh. Why? Because we know Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which has to do with this body of Christ. But it's not just his physical flesh. It's his resurrected body. You don't hear a lot about that 
in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The most you hear about is when he raises from the dead, and then he walks through walls and needs some honeycomb, and that's it, right? So great, our glorified body. It's going to be wonderful. We're going to be able to, you know, not die anymore and walk around. And yeah, that's great. That's wonderful. Resurrection was prophesied since the world began. But there's something more to this body of Christ that you have access to that Christians typically don't know about. Or Ephesians 1.19, Paul prays here that you might know, in verse 18, your understanding of being enlightened, that you might know what is the hope of his calling. Remember, you're called into one body, the body of Christ. What hope does that bring you? The hope of your calling. And the riches, the glory of this inheritance. What riches do you have by being the body of Christ? What are they? In verse 18, or 19 says, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us? You have power because you're part of the body of Christ. This power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. You see that? So he's not talking about the power of Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry. He's not talking about the power of God through the covenants and the plagues and parting the waters, but the power of God in Christ when he raised him from the dead. And it says, he set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. You don't find that spoken about in prophecy. Far above all principality and power. And prophecy, we'll, we'll talk about this tomorrow, Christ was prophesied to be raised up as what? The king of Israel. The ruler of the world. That's pretty great. I mean, that's more than you can do. <laughs> Right? But what's above that is being raised above all principality and power in heavenly places, every might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but that which is to come. Doesn't that up the ante a bit? Yeah. He has put all things under his feet, everything, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. Body of Christ is the mystery, folks. That is not Israel. Israel is a nation on the earth. They'll be gathered together to have a kingdom, and they'll be above the nations. But what's his body going to be? With him above all things. Right? This body of Christ is a mystery. But it's, it's a new thing. Look at Ephesians 2.15. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, this is what Christ did, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances to make in himself, Christ makes in himself, we're talking about the body of Christ, you being in him, he makes in himself of twain, one new man. The mystery is one new man. That's what it is. All right? And you have to read more to find out what, uh, about what that entails. Look at Ephesians 4, 24. The instructions about the way you live then says here to be renewed in the spirit of your mind and ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Now, if you read that to say, well, I'm going to clean up my act. I was a dirty, filthy scoundrel, you know, and my speech was contemptible, and, and I'm going to clean myself up. I'm a new person. Uh, that's not the mystery, and that's not what that's saying. The new man is not you cleaning yourself up. The new man is you in Christ. That's, that's the new man. Put on Christ. Well, what's that mean? Well, that's a good thing to study out, isn't it? What that means, but that's the mystery. In Colossians 3, 10 and 11, we were there just a moment ago. By the way, if you plant down Ephesians, you probably won't be doing pretty well with all the references I have here today. Colossians 3, verse 10. Put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. Okay, so he says, put on the new man, which is created by him. So it's one body, it's one new man, it's one body, and the Bible also calls it a new creature. You see in this verse here, it was created by him. You heard that word new creature? If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. That's not talking about you individually in your own lifestyle, cleaning up your act. This is the, the, the body of Christ, the corporate one. There's only one. When you make it you and you and you and you, how many of them are there? Well, there's lots of them. But the mystery is one body of Christ that we're all in. And if any man be in Christ today, he is a new creature. This is the new creature. This is the new man. This is the one body. Christ is the head. We're all members of his body. That's what that is. Right? And so old things are passed away. All things become new. The old things there have to do with how God was trying to obtain fellowship with humanity. The old things through Israel and through their covenants and through the vineyard and through everything else. Those things are gone away. He's now seeking a fellowship with men through and according to this mystery. Old things are passed away. All things become new. 
right? How do you deal with God? How do I get to be one with God? Well, according to the mystery. Not according to a covenant and fellowship according to Israel. According to this, right? Galatians 6.15 In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision avails anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Apparently, this idea of the body of Christ, this one new body, this new man, this new creature, that if any man be in Christ, he's in it. Apparently, how you get in this thing has nothing to do with whether you're circumcised or not. It has nothing to do with your, whether you're Israel or not. It has nothing to do with whether you have a covenant or you've kept the commandments or do good works. None of that is how you get into this one body. Right? He says, that doesn't avail anything, these works. The new creature avails everything. You're either in that or you're not. It's either you're saved or you're not. And if you're saved, you're in the body of Christ. You're in the new creature. That's the mystery. Okay? Now I want to cover two passages with the remainder of my time here that uh, clearly define the mystery um, that you probably know already. But I want to go through and explain these in light of what we now know what is the mystery of Christ. Look at Ephesians 3, verse 6. One of the questions at the back of your bulletin was, can you explain the mystery without using the word mystery? I'm going to make it easy for you today. I'm going to uh, show you these verses about the mystery that have the word mystery in them. Tomorrow, uh, Brother Jeremy here will explain to you how you can find the mystery in all of Paul's epistles, even when the word's not used. Because when you know what it is, you know what you can find other places in Paul's epistles? The mystery of the body of Christ. Okay? So, w when you look up in your course the word mystery, that's... That's first grade Bible study. Necessary. You need to do it. Right? But you need to graduate to, I need to know what it is. So when I read the scripture, I know if it's talking about that or not. Right? Not only where I find the word. But Ephesians 3, in verse uh, 4, 5, and 6. Well, maybe we should back up to verse 1 there. He says, for you Gentiles. You see that? For you Gentiles. Why is this dispensation of grace, this mystery that Paul's talking about, appropriate and relevant for Gentiles? Because Gentiles have something to do with it. Right? Oh, we just read there's this new creature where it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. So that's good news for who? Gentiles. Because before you had to go through Israel's fellowship. You had to get through them because they had that connection with God. But now, there is no more special fellowship with Israel. Now it's fellowships open for everyone according to the mystery. So that is good news for Gentiles. And so it's for you Gentiles. Remember in Ephesians 2, verse 11. I'm going the wrong direction, aren't I? It says, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision. Verse 12, at that time you were without Christ. What's that mean, without Christ? You had no fellowship with him, right? You were without Christ. It says, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. What, why does that matter? Because Israel had a special fellowship with God. And strangers from the covenants of promise. Well, where did those covenants come from? God. You see the fellowship language in verse 12? That was not given to you. It was given to Israel. You were without God and with no hope in the world. Right? So what it's saying there, yes, there's Israel and covenants and laws and all that. What it's saying, though, generally, is that God had a special fellowship with Israel. And if you wanted to have fellowship with God, you had to go through Israel. Remember that in time past? He says, now that's not happening anymore. He goes on to explain the new man. This new way of having fellowship with Christ. The fellowship of the mystery. Another thing we can read from that is that Israel already had a fellowship with God. Right? So again, to say the mystery, oh, it's fellowship with God. No, no, Israel already had that. Now, they kind of squandered it. But they had it. God promised them and covenanted them and gave them the law. Remember in Romans chapter 3, verse 4? What advantage has the Jew? Unto them were given the oracles of God. God talked to them and gave them oracles and revelations and prophets and laws. And here, you're my people. I mean, he said, I'm having fellowship with you. And what they do? You know, for a while, they said, yay. And then they turned around and, you know, like we all would do. Right? You say, why would God even set up a fellowship with Israel that way if he knew they were going to fail? He did it to prove to us that we could never keep fellowship with him. Because, look, I tried it over here with these guys. They didn't do it. And that proves humanity can never keep fellowship with God. He wants fellowship with us, and we can never have fellowship back with him. Which is why we'll see later this mystery fellowship is so great. Because it does not require us to maintain the fellowship. You ever heard teaching in, 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 from church about you losing fellowship with God if you've done such and so? Right? And so what happens to my sin if I'm a Christian? Well, you've lost fellowship with God. Don't worry. Confess your sins and get back into fellowship with him. Right? That's Israel's language. 
That was the fellowship, the covenant, the contract God had with them, right? You go to work for your employer and you've got a, a, an understood agreement on you work X amount of hours for Y amount of money or less than that, you know. Mike Trout has an agreement with the angels for $430 million. That's a different agreement than what you have. You go to your work on Monday and you say, hey, I want $430 million for the next 12 years. What's your employer going to say? <laughs> Get a life. Get out of here. <laughs> I ain't doing that. There's different agreements, right? Different contracts, different connections, different fellowships. God had a fellowship with Israel, and he's got a fellowship he's offering the world today according to the mystery. Okay, they're not the same. This is true. And we've got to know what makes them different. Israel had the promises and covenants. Romans 9 verse 4 says they were given the covenants and the adoption and the promises and the service of God. They had all that stuff. They were working with the Lord in Romans 9 verse 4. That's why Paul wants to get them saved because they, they had a fellowship with God and they, they've, they've lost it because of their sin. He's saying, I want to get them saved even according to this. Right? So they can maintain fellowship with God according to the mystery. That's why Paul has that heart for Israel. But let's go back to Ephesians 3.6, the verse I wanted to take you to. Ephesians 3.6. The mystery in verse 4 says, As I wrote a four and few words. Where did Paul write about this mystery, people ask? You know, there are two chapters before chapter 3. We've already mentioned plenty of verses in chapter 1 and chapter 2 describing this mystery fellowship. If you know what it is, you don't have to see the word mystery to understand it. What baffles people is that the word mystery shows up in Ephesians 3 for the first time, and they go, well, wait a minute, there's this new thing in Ephesians 3 here, it's called a mystery. Well, what it is, is described in chapter 1 and chapter 2. You see? So what is it? Well, you can't read it in Ephesians 3, 1 through 4, you've got to go back where he wrote it to 4 and understand what it is. But verse 6, he does give a summary here. Thank God he gives a summary. This isn't, this isn't the limitation of what it is, but it's that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. See those three things there? Fellow heirs of the same body, partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. What's it mean to be a fellow heir? What's it mean to have fellowship? We already covered it. It's a connection, a joint interest, a partnership, right? If you're a fellow heir, an heir is someone who receives an inheritance, who receives the riches bestowed upon them by their father or by their you know, predecessors, right? An heir. You receive things. If Christ is the heir of God, and you're a fellow heir with Christ, according to the mystery, what's that make you? There's a controversy going around whether or not you are a joint heir with Christ if you're saved. I don't know why there's a controversy. It's ridiculous to say that you're not. Because the mystery of Christ is you're a fellow heir of Christ. You have a joint interest in the inheritance from God because you're in the body. The only way you're not a joint heir is if you're not in the body. You see, there's a problem. People don't know what the mystery is. And they're trying to create these other doctrines that are confusing people and confusing the truth. Right? Fellow heirs, a joint inheritance with Christ for sinners even. I mean, what does a sinner have to inherit from God? Well, you sin, so you get a smaller cookie. I mean, sinners don't get anything from God. They get judgment and punishment. And so salvation has something to do with this. How in the world do you get in that body, you know? But you're in this body and you have this inheritance from God, this fellow heirship with Christ. Look in Ephesians 1.7. Paul says, have you heard of this dispensation of the abundant grace of God? And we use that to talk about the Baptists who never heard it and the Methodists who never heard it, right? But have you ever heard it? I mean, have you read Ephesians 1 and 2? Because people say, oh yeah, I've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God. I've heard about it. What is it? Um, um, I just heard that there is one. All right. Then, then you ask, you know, what do you want us to teach about? And you say, well, can you have a lesson on the riches of Christ? Anyone want to know what those are? Amen, right? That's what this mystery is. It's the riches of Christ. It's the dispensation of all the gracious riches that you have in the body. Look at Ephesians 1, verse 7. Ephesians 1, it says, You're accepted in the beloved. He has chosen you before the foundation of the world in him. He's predestinated you to the adoption of children. Verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace. In verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. What is the dispensation of grace? It's not a line on your chart. It's the riches of grace given to all those in the body, which was never given to people before because there was nobody. Right? 
And so you have riches here in Ephesians 1, verse 7. Look at Ephesians 2, verse 7. Paul wants you to know about this abundant grace and these riches, the inheritance you have in Christ. Because it's a mystery, folks. Ephesians 2, verse 7. You are a sinner walking according to the course of this world. You are dead in trespasses and sins. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great lo love, wherewith he loved us, when we were dead in sins, quickened us together with Christ, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. Verse 7 is where I'm now reading with you. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through what? Israel's covenant in the New Testament. Through Jesus Christ. He's not just tacking it on because he's a Christian. It's how you get the riches. Through Christ. That's the channel now. The fellowship is no longer a covenant with Israel. It's through the body. Because you're a member of his body. If you're a member of his body, guess what? What the body gets, you get. Right? The food goes in your mouth. And which part of your body gets fed the food? Just your toes, right? Because it goes down in gravity. No, every part of the body benefits from the food that goes in the mouth. Okay, when someone gives you a blessing, your whole body gets the blessing, right? That's the idea, I mean, legally. You're in Christ, you're in the body of Christ. When Christ has these riches and these graces and the inheritance, who gets it? His whole body. Well, there are some body parts, and they're really committed and convicted, and other body parts are kind of lazy and weak, and so it's only the committed ones that get it. Does that comport with the idea of the body of Christ? Not at all, Right? There's no hierarchy here. Every, is one body member greater than another body member? No. So this fellowship, this oneness, connection is described by the body of Christ. It tells you how you get the riches of Christ because you're in his body. And that's how I know I get it freely and how you don't get more than me because it's, Christ's body gets it. And we're all members of his body. You see, lots of questions get answered by understanding what this is. So in Ephesians 3, 2, where he says, have you heard of the dispensation of grace? Well, You've, you've now heard and can explain what that is. Look at Ephesians 1, verse 11. By the way, verse 10, we know something else about the mystery of his will, which is that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, God's plan is that all things be brought together in him. It's not so right now. Right now, the mystery is that you are in him. Any man in Christ is in him. But at one time, all things will be in him because he wants to give the riches of his grace to all. Right? Right? In verse 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. In verse 13, in whom we also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, also after you were believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. People say, well, the church began at Pentecost, because that's what the Holy Spirit was given. Well, you don't need to be at Pentecost to receive the Holy Spirit. If you believe the gospel of the grace of God, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit because it, you're in the body. And the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, are one. Which means what about you? Know you not the Holy Spirit dwells in you? Well, how did he dwell in me? I didn't speak in tongues or, you know, pray him down or nothing. Because you're in the body. If you're saved, you got the Holy Spirit. Right? In fact, there's nothing you lack in the body. You're complete in him. What a glorious mystery this is. So you have the Spirit as the earnest of your inheritance. And Paul wants you to know about that. Now, that's the first part, your fellow heirs with Christ. second part is you're the same body. We've covered some of that already. And don't read into that, you're the same body with Israel. Oh, goodness, don't do that. The NIV does that. The NIV says, this is a Bible, New International Version. It's better than the King James, the preface says. And then Ephesians 3, verse 6 says, you're the same body with Israel. What? First of all, it's not in any Greek manuscript. Secondly, that's totally destroying the mystery of the one body. You see, there's a, there's, there's a doctrinal problem, I think, with that. So you'd be persuading your own mind about it. The same body. You're the body of Christ, not with Israel. 1 Corinthians 10, 16, and 17. Now, you go to 1 Corinthians 10 and 11 to talk about communion. And this is a question grace believers have. What about communion? I know the mystery. I know right division. Oh, do you? What about communion? Oh, I don't know. How big is the cracker? <laughs> What is communion? Isn't that where Christians get together to eat and drink stuff? No, it's not. That's, that's like fun and fellowship, you know, carry over from the Baptist church or whatever. 1 Corinthians 10, communion, by the way, only mentioned by Paul, is a doctrine, not a dinner. You understand? It's a doctrine, not a dinner. The communion you have is with who? Christ. 
Communion describes the fellowship that you have with Christ. And guess what? If you and I are both in the body of Christ, what's that mean about you and I in communion? We're one together as well. So communion with Christ, communion with one another, that's the teaching. It's not, oh, this is my blood for a new testament, a new covenant. And if you follow me, you'll be in that new covenant, you'll enter the kingdom. We don't gather together because we're all in a similar covenant. We gather together as one body. Mystery? Right? Communion with one another according to the mystery of Christ. That's what that means. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16 and 17 says, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, being many, are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. What's the one bread? Jesus. Right? Partakers of that. His body and his blood shed on the cross for you, and you become one body as a result. There's no mention in these two verses, by the way, of you know, how much you're allowed to drink or how much you're allowed to eat when you get together to eat. The Corinthians had that struggle. If you have a struggle with eating as it regards to communion, this is a Corinthian problem. You say, well, you don't eat when you have communion? No, we do. We eat things. Because when we get together as a body, whether we are teaching, whether we're eating, we do all things as what? One body. Right? That's the doctrine that drives the things that we do. So you have communion there in the same body. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, By one spirit you're all baptized into one body. That drives how we act towards one another. It's like some covenant tells us, well, this is what you need to, how you treat your neighbor, and this is how you treat your, your enemy. And, right? Where's the rules? There's no rules. You're part of one body. Right? How would you treat your left hand and your right hand? So, well, they're both mine. Exactly. <laughs> and all of y'all are Christ's. Right? So this is the way that you operate. So we're not placed into Israel and their covenants, but into the one body with one Lord, with one head, with one spirit, with one hope, one, one, one. It seems to be the idea. And what's that describe? A fellowship according to the mystery. Because according to Israel's covenants, it wasn't just one. There was Israel and Gentiles. There was one nation above the other nations. According to the mystery, one body. Either in it or you're not. Either saved or you're not. Right? The third part of Ephesians 3, 6 is partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Partakers of his promise. Now, the promise that God gave is salvation in Titus 1, verse 2. Promise of eternal life from the beginning of the world. He promised salvation and fellowship, right? But if the mystery says you're partakers of his promise, how? Don't forget those last four words. In Christ, by the gospel. It's not your partakers of Israel's spiritual things by the covenant but partakers of his promise in Christ. That's speaking to the body of Christ by the gospel. We'll learn later there are other people in Christ, right? But how do they get into Christ? That's different. In Christ by the gospel of the grace of God is crucial. That's the mystery. And so this mystery is you being in Christ. And if you're in Christ, everything that is his is yours. All of his riches, all of his position in heavenly places, all of the glory that he gives you the hope of, it's all yours. It's blessed and wonderful and glorious. Do you have to work for it? You're in him. Does he have to work for it? He did the work. It's him that gets it. Now there's another side to this mystery coin. And that's Colossians 1.27. We'll, we'll end it here and I'll talk more about this later today. But in Colossians 1.27, you in Christ, the body of Christ is the mystery. And since you're in him, you dwell in him, you have access to his position and his riches and everything that is his. His body is yours. Okay? Everything that he has is yours. The other side to this coin is your body. Hmm? What happens to your body when you get put into Christ? You know, you all got saved and you fell down on the floor dead, right? No, you kept walking around. And you got this vessel, this body. There's the other side of this mystery, which is not only you in Christ, but what? Do you know? Christ in you. Colossians 1, verse 27. Notice the phrase here. To whom God will make known that what is the riches of the glory of this mystery. The riches we talked about because you're in Christ, right? The riches, but not, they go beyond just the things you get from him that he does towards you. But verse 27 says, the mystery among the Gentiles, which is, hey, what's the mystery of Christ? That's not a bad verse to explain it. It's Christ in you. Well, that's different than you and Christ, isn't it? 
eh, same words, different order, doesn't matter. It does. <laughs> you in Christ mean you get everything that is his. Him in you means what? You have Christ in you, according to the mystery. Everything that is yours is his. Remember, you're bought with a price? That's that. Right? So this talks about all the riches and things you get in glory because all of his things are yours. This means all of yours are his. Now, when you think about that, you're going, well, I got nothing to offer God. I mean, I used to offer tithes and offerings, but God doesn't need money and stuff. Right? He doesn't need your house and your car. Like, what's God, what do I have that God needs? Body. <laughs> he needs mouths. He needs hands. In this planet, people say, what is God doing in the world? Trying to put people in the body of Christ and putting himself in others so they can put other people in the body of Christ? You see, the ministry doesn't get done without Christ in people. Christ in you, performing through you. You letting you be a member of the body of Christ so that you can minister his, his ministry. You can preach his gospel. You could help put people in the body and the cycle continues to edify the body of Christ, which is his goal. Christ in you, folks. All of your things are his. What about my mind? Can I still have my own opinions and thoughts and minds and desires? And, you know, I, Christ, I'll let you stay inside, but I want those things. If he's in you, all your things are, all your thoughts are his, all your uh, plans are his, all your purposes are his, all your things are his, all of yours are his. That's the exchange. That's the fellowship. All of his things are yours, and all of your things are his. Welcome to the fellowship of the mystery. That's what that means. And by the way, folks, it's glorious. This part hurts more. <laughs> but you realize if you're dead, then why, why should it? If you're dead in Christ because he died and therefore you died, then what, why should it hurt? But it does hurt more because we still want our flesh to live. Right? Well, not if Christ is in you. You're dead. But what's more glorious, remember we said earlier that one body is a resurrected body? We'll talk about this later. Christ in you is not you being dead and that's it, full stop. It's you being risen. You living a resurrected life. That's what that is. And that's the mystery, okay? So Christ in you means all your things are his, and this is the fellowship of the mystery, you and him, and he and you. This fellowship describes all the riches you get from God. It also describes the power of God to work in the depths of your soul to perform ministry in the world. That's the mystery. Session about the cross and how it fits in. Because I didn't mention the cross here at all, did I? Right? The cross was prophesied, but there is a mystery aspect to what Christ accomplished at the cross and by the cross, right? And we're going to talk about that later. So before we do that, let's uh, sing a hymn.